Welcome back to The Pursuit Podcast. I'm your host, Jessica Rose. In April, we're going to be looking at different aspects of wearable technology. Today, I'm joined by Rachel Konnichiwa Kitty, and we're going to be talking about getting into wearables as a beginner and as a hobbyist. I'm here today with Rachel Wong. Rachel, what do you do? As a day job, I do stem cell research. Specifically, I'm working on a PhD project that involves growing eyes, like eyeballs, um, to study blindness. That is impossible. You're very casual about that as well. You'd be like, oh, I just make eyeballs. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> it's baffling, but I haven't begged you on the podcast to come on to talk about growing eyeballs, mm-hmm. which I think I might try and bully you back on to talk about another time. Okay. We're here today to talk about your, your sort of side projects. What kind of beautiful things do you do? Initially, I was making jewelry and then I got into, um, I got involved with electronics and I thought, huh, I'll combine them both. And so at the moment, I'm working on wearable fashion technology. So when you say wearable fashion technology, what kinds of things do you mean? What, what's the first thing you ever made? Um, so well, I call it wearable fashion technology because when I say wearable tech, Um, wearable technology, a lot of people immediately think of those health fitness trackers. Oh, yeah. Not very fun. No. And that's what everyone thinks of when you say wearable technology. So I want to just make it clear that it is wearable, but at the same time, fashionable. For example, I would incorporate things like electronics into clothing or like necklaces, jewelry, and it looks good at the same time it has all the features of lighting and yeah you can also add in features of of course the usual health technology but it's more fashion focused and this is going to be a hard question because we're in an audio only format Mm -hmm. but I was wondering if I could get you to describe sort of your style or aesthetic because every time I run into you you're dressed like my most beautiful childhood (laughs) sugar rush dreams (gasps) (laughs) <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So I think my aesthetic is uh, a lot of it is influenced by Japanese fashion. So I love color. And one of the things I'm trying to do is to eliminate dark colors from my wardrobe just because I feel like the weather in London is already so gloomy <laughs> and I don't need to add to it. Yeah. So I, I love Japanese fashion. I love like the kawaii style I love rainbows and pastel colors, yeah. Yeah, so you're just bringing these beautiful rays of sunshine everywhere you go in gloomy London. And a lot of your fashion tech wearables are are very, very brightly colored. Yes, I think at the moment, the technology for fashion technology itself, it's a lot of it is trying to incorporate colors and how you can actually get, for example, the electronic bits, which are light emitting colors, to flash or work in a certain way. And, you know, instead of wearing, say, normal clothing, which has a design and it's a fixed design, using technology and electronics, we can make that design move and be more, I guess, have a more greater impact when people see it. That's really exciting. So one of the things I was really excited about, about having you come on, is maybe talk us through... What are the first steps if I saw some of your projects and I was like, oh, wow, I really want to make a headband that has light up bunny ears on it. Mm -hmm. What are sort of the first kinds of projects you'd recommend for a beginner? Um, And what kind of materials do you recommend they they try first? Would you recommend lights to start out with? Would you recommend starting with just adding some lights to something? Or would you look for like a lot more interactivity from a first project? Um, I would say that because I learned about electronics by myself, just like um, what is the positive, negative and things like that. I think that's the easiest way to learn is to learn the basics of electronics. And I would say that if you want to start incorporating um, electronics into just anything, I think the easiest way to learn is to learn about the negatives, the positives of a LED And from there, understand how to power it. And then there is no need to learn programming at that step because then it makes things more complicated. So 
yeah, I would say to learn from the basics LEDs first. Okay, so if our dear listener is really excited about making something beautiful and cute, they don't necessarily have to learn all of the programming. Just learn enough to make that one first thing. Yeah, yeah, I would say, yeah, you know, if, if you have an idea and you want it to become real, like what are how can you break it down into the simplest steps first and get that started? Because once you have like a, a simple project, you can add to it. Do you remember what your first project is that you incorporated electronics into? Um, hmm. I would say, oh, I don't really remember which one my first no project worries. is. <laughs> but I think the first one that got really popular is a Hello Kitty headband, like a kind of like it looks like a floral crown that I built on top of a headband. And it was just using strips of lights. In this case, these strips of lights, like it doesn't require programming. It's just like it's timed in a certain way that it would flash a different color. So I just added that and then built on it because I have some experience making mermaid crowns and things like that. So I just built onto that and yeah, so it gives it a bigger effect. That sounds really exciting. So a lot of this that we're talking about might be a little bit difficult for listeners to picture. If you say, oh, you know, it's a Hello Kitty crown. It's a lot like a mermaid crown. A lot of people might be like, oh, wh what's a mermaid crown? What would be the best place for folks who wanted to follow along while we're chatting to take a look at some of the things you've built? I think the best place is to look at my Etsy shop. And my Etsy shop is called Konnichiwa Kitty Shop. That's where I sell mermaid crowns, which haven't got any electronics incorporated. So it's basically like a, a crown that people can wear at like big events. Like I had this person buy from me and she wore it for her wedding. Oh, how lovely. Yes. <laughs> You're saying that I don't have to build anything. I could just sort of try and buy stuff off of you if I'm really lazy. Yes, you can do that. Um, I haven't started selling big electronic pieces like clothing and things like that. It's mostly at the moment on my Etsy shop, they are little electronic gummy bears that come as a keychain or a badge. How exciting is that? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm pretty excited because I also have a tutorial on how to make these electronic badges in Make Magazine, which will be coming out at the end of this month. Instead of listening to a podcast to try and work out what a great first step might be in building wearables, you've gone ahead and built a tutorial that's coming out. Yes, that's right. Yeah, it will be. Yeah, it will be coming out soon. And I'm really excited. It describes the steps on how to use resin with electronics. Very exciting. So there you have it, dear listener. If you want your first step to be how to build cute gummy bears into resin. Wait, gummy bears? Yes, they are, they are shaped as gummy bears. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. If you want your first steps with wearables to be making cute resin gummy bears to put electronics in, Rachel's got you in the next Make magazine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. What kinds of things do you wish you had known when you first started out? Are there any materials that are especially useful or easy? Or are there any things that are really difficult to work with? Um, I think it depends how big of an idea you have. I would say, as I, I said before, like beginner steps, it would be good if you can visualize and break it down into simple steps and start building the tiny and easier parts first. And then I'm someone who like has really big dreams, really big ideas. So I do challenge myself a lot. I'm not very good at programming. So when I have an idea that involves programming. I spend a lot of time um, on it more than other people. So yeah, I would say really try to get the basics of hardware and electronics right first. And then um, when you move on to programming, it will be much easier because then you don't have to worry about grasping two different concepts. What's the thing you've made so far that you're the most proud of? Is it the, the Hello Kitty crown? Oh, this is slightly... It's a bit like, <laughs> which child is your favorite child? <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, exactly. It's like choosing my favorite. I don't know. Actually, I think the one piece that I think that amazes people the most is a floral lay that I've made. And this was actually 
requested by a speaker at a textile conference. And so this is basically, it's quite a big, well, like a chunky floral necklace. And basically there are ring lights connected in a row. And these lights will move clockwise in a or like step-by-step manner. So it moves forward like at each second and then it starts moving backwards at each second. And people can have a look at this themselves by going to your Twitter, which is Konnichiwa Kitty as well. Yeah. I'm looking at this as you describe it and it is these beautiful fabric flowers and it looks like the light sort of pours down the necklace and around. Yes. I think you may have buried the lead in there though. Does that suggest that you do commissions? I've, so far, I think I've not done any, well, I mean, I do commissions for my gummy bears because I do have the, um, people can request any color, any design. But in this case, it's it was kind of, yeah, it's a commission, but at the same time, it was a favor because I actually knew her. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so if someone was trying to get you to build something for them, step one is to be best friends with you. Step two is to pay you. Yes. <laughs> So one thing I think is really interesting, and I think that you've gotten a little bit of press for, but maybe not enough attention, was a really, really sort of low-tech fix that you made with LEDs to make them a lot more sewable. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So basically, as you know, I try to create, well, I try to make things wearable with electronics. I try to make it comfortable, wearable, and doesn't look like a big chunky piece of technology attached to you. So it's not just sort of a battery glued to you. More subtle. Yeah, exactly. So I always try to like think of ways that regular pieces of electronics, I try to make them more wearable. So in that case where regular LEDs, I basically bent um, the shape of the legs so that you can actually use it kind of like Instead of the legs sticking out and you'd have to solder them the normal way, I've curled them around and you can sew through them. That way, it's so much cheaper because when electronics are sold as wearables, the price just goes up a lot. So in this case, I've made it small, affordable, and they are just regular electronics. So LEDs, which have sort of the little bulb bit and then two... So almost metal pins, the two wires hanging down. Mm-hmm. You've just taken a, some needle nose pliers and turned each of those wires into a small curl. Yes. A loop at either side that you can sew with conductive thread. Yes, that's right. Yeah. That is brilliant. And I look forward to not only me stealing this idea, but hopefully everybody who's wanted to try sewing lights into their things, uh, hopefully stealing it and crediting you. Yeah, there was a, actually a blog post written by one of the bloggers for Make Magazine because I did basically... It was just a simple thread on uh, Twitter where I was showing how I tried to incorporate these LEDs into a simple felt Christmas tree. Yeah, that's really exciting. So you've mentioned a couple of resources so far, including your gummy bear tutorial that's coming out in Make Magazine. What kinds of resources, where can people look on or offline if they want to try their first wearables project? I would say, well... To find tutorials on wearables, it's quite difficult, actually, if you try to, say, go to a magazine shop and look for wearable technology, because that was something I did initially. I was like, okay, you know, I want to get inspired. I want to know what people have made. Went to a magazine shop and I couldn't find anything that related technology to fashion or wearables. So I would say the best place to start is online and If you can, try to find people on Twitter. Like I would say go and perhaps follow the Guild of Makers because we have, they organize a session every Wednesday and then we talk about the things that we've made. And a lot of people who contribute to that session are people who make wearable fashion technology. And when you follow these people, they've got tutorials. I've set up a website, but I'm not very good (laughs) at keeping up with it. Yeah. Oh, so I thought you were just saying that you weren't very good. I was like, that's clearly oh. a lie. <laughs> no, but I'm not very good at updating my website because I've been so busy. 
But I'm like, I'm really happy to help if you just drop me a line on Twitter and I can like direct you anywhere. And if you have any questions about LEDs and how to incorporate electronics or what kind of microcontrollers to use to get started, I'm very happy to answer questions. But I would say that. Okay. Yeah. What kind of microcontrollers are you used to get started? I would say, <laughs> no problem. Um, I would say that the easiest, well, for me, I started with the Raspberry Pi Zero W. So the one with the Wi-Fi. And I thought that was the simplest way to start because after that, when I tried to use the Arduino platform, it's the whole interface itself seems to be a lot more complicated and it takes a lot more time. So yeah, the Raspberry Pi is definitely at the moment my favorite. I've also tried the Microbit and the Microbit is great for um, beginners to understand building blocks that creates a code because they use a building blocks programming. Yeah, and uh, Raspberry Pi uses Python, which it's not something that I've learned formally, but when you look at it, it's quite easy to understand what you're trying to say. And a lot of times the codes that are available online in Python also include a lot of comments to explain like what each line of code means. So looking back at your past work, you've done a lot of jewelry, a lot of really cute headbands that light up and do different things, mm-hmm. and a couple of full dresses that have LED strips sewn into them in different functionality. Yeah. What kinds of things do you want to experiment with next? So um, <laughs> initially I had a plan. This was, yeah, before I started exhibiting my clothes that I wanted to make. Because in Japan, there is a lot of like, they call it maid cafes, M-A-I-D, where when you go into the cafe, they are very accommodating to you. You know, they try to understand your needs or they try to, yeah, basically they try to cater to you. And I wanted to make something like that, but in a way that is able to, it will contain sensors that will be able to say, tell your temperature and things like that. And I want that to be like a reflection of who I'm communicating with. So that way, if like the person, I mean, I could include things like color sensors as well. So if that person is say dressed in blue, I could turn blue and, <gasps> and that way, you know, it's kind of like more accommodating. Yeah. So I, that was the idea. More like an M-A-D-E made cafe. No, it's a M-A-I-D. So they would dress in like really cute outfits and yeah. So they would like basically serve drinks or cakes and things like that. Yeah. Oh, I was saying that your idea of having a made cafe or even the the outfits for it that are reflective, that work really, really well and have a lot of maker things built in it seemed a bit more like a maker made cafe. <laughs> that, that could also be a good one, actually. Yeah, it could translate into that, definitely. So I think that looking at your work, it's really inspiring because you've taken a lot of different interests that you don't often see in technology and you very rarely see in hardware. And you've absolutely made this part of technology a part of who you are. Yeah, definitely. I The thing that I'm really proud of is that I can be who I really am in terms of, you know, even like when I was going for interviews and things like that, my mom was like, you're not going to get a job with that hair color. And... <laughs> I have had all sorts of hair color and yeah, and I've shown that, you know, you can be exactly who you are. You can dress however you like and you can still, you know, get the things that you want. And this is a message that I like to convey to children when I'm at exhibitions, especially young girls that, you know, if they wanted to do beauty blogging, they can do that and they can also do anything else like electronics, which a lot of people think is something that younger boys prefer over what girls would prefer. But, you know, you can you can do anything that you think of and everything at the same time. And it is so refreshing to see so unapologetically femme electronics work. Your pieces are fluffy and they're pink and they're green and they're glittery and they light up. Yes. It's really exciting. Yes. I imagine that when you do meet yeah. kids, especially little girls, that they're just over the moon. They are, they are, because I have went to the make Derby Mini Maker Fair and like the young girls that I've met there, they would think that I did beauty blogging because I use makeup and I would be like, no, actually I'm a scientist and I also make cool stuff like this. And they're like, they're so inspired. It just, it really makes my day. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think adults, we've got the same thing, but we try and be cool. I'll be like, oh, that's the best thing ever. Don't be weird. Don't be weird. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. What kinds of things would you like to see change or develop or emerge in the wearable market in the next couple of years? Mm. Because right now you've said that when you say wearables, everybody thinks Fitbits or Jawbones or whatever. What do you want people to think about when they hear wearables in three years, in five, in 10? I think that when people think wearables, it shouldn't be... I think a lot of the idea now is that when people think wearables, you know, other than the fitness trackers, they think, oh, attaching technology to your body via a carrier like cloth or a strap around your arm. I think in the future people should think of wearables like a second skin. It shouldn't be something that feels it's jetting out of you, but rather it should be seamless to you. So I don't think that a wearable technology should be like making a really tiny computer and strapping it to your arm because at the end of the day, you still want to use a computer. You still want to have that screen. You still want to be able to, you know, work on something that's comfortable and not attached to your arm and it's tiny and keyboard is just too small. You want something that is seamless, like say in the future, you want to be able to enjoy an experience. Whatever you wear should enhance the experience rather than, as I said, attaching a computer to your body. That shouldn't be what wearable technology is. That's really fantastic. So really thinking about things and designing things and designing worn experiences Mm -hmm. that give you something additional, not just making increasingly tiny watches. Exactly. Yes. I figured you were going the whole e watch. Oh, what do we call e watches? Uh, yeah. Smart watches. Oh, I'm very Smart old. Smart watches. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They used to be called e watches, and it was yeah. <laughs> I think it's still oh, I, acceptable. I to, I'm not sure that was ever a thing. I think you're just being very, very diplomatic. But I appreciate it. Email. <laughs> We'll just call them cyber watches. We'll we'll go all in. (laughs) Yes. Mm -hmm. So if folks want to find your work, they can find you on Twitter as Konnichiwa Kitty. They can find you on Etsy as Konnichiwa Kitty. Yes. Where's that website, even though you said you don't update it too often? It's called KonnichiwaKitty.com. Yes. (laughs) I feel like you've really taken a great concept and just stuck with it. You're like, you know what? I'm going to show up first. I'm going to get this great handle. Everything will be fine. Yeah, so I like to be known as Rachel Konnichiwa Kitty because I feel like that would be kind of like my stage name and also branding at the same time. Very important to have a personal brand. Mm -hmm. If folks were really interested in these beautiful experiences, these wonderful, fashionable things you've built, and they wanted to see other people who were building in the same space, is there anybody else out there who builds wearables that you're like, you know what? I'm really inspired by this person. You should check them out too. There is a lot of people that have been very inspiring. I can think of Angela from, she's from Spark Fun. She makes a ton of wearable stuff and she writes all the tutorials for wearables as well on Spark Fun, I believe. That is a very good place to start learning wearables because I've also used her tutorials at workshop just to show because one of the skills you have to learn when you're doing wearables is sewing. She's got very good like detailed images step by step on how to sew components into your piece of clothing and I think that yeah she's got very good tutorials on that. Who else? Tanya from Pimorini. So she writes really, she blogs for Pimorini as well. So she's got really good, what she's written is like explanation of how things work, which I think is really great because I think a lot of us, when we do something, we don't necessarily know how it works, but having the understanding of it allows you to manipulate it better. Oh, there's so many Just people. Give us one more and I'll let you escape. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, I'm going to say Naomi will because she's on Make Magazine now. She's made it. <laughs> um, she's yeah. been great for a long time. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, yeah, she has. And I think now she's like been acknowledged for the things that she makes. She makes, um, she makes really cool stuff like light up skirts. I think she also used, I'm not sure what it's called, but basically she did a project that basically it blinks and she made like a, a skirt. She made a top that consists of like many panels and these panels, they 
when they blink, they either turn opaque or transparent. <laughs> so how yeah, very thought, cool! It was very cool, yeah, because it's like, oh no, you don't know what you're gonna see. <laughs> yeah, so I wasn't yeah. trying to bait you, but I was quite hoping you'd be like, oh, I hope we get Naomi a mention in here because she's just fantastic. Uh, yeah, yeah, Rachel. You've been so absolutely patient with all of my very exciting questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, well, thank you for having me. (laughs) And dear listener, thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you've been inspired to go ahead and build some weird pretty wearables yourself. Some of the resources we've mentioned today are Rachel's website, konnichiwakiri.com, her on Twitter, konnichiwakiri, her Etsy shop, but also things like Make Magazine and the tutorials written by the good folks at Pimeroni. Thank you for listening. Next week, join us when we're going to be talking to the co-founder of Dame Products about wearables for female intimate use. Mm-hmm.